a lot of people are facing, yeah, it's an overused cliche, an existential crisis. They don't know what they're living for. They don't know what the meaning of life is. It's like, well, yeah, because women won't transmit cultural values anymore. They mm -hmm. simply won't as, as a collective, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Christian women will and other groups of women will and certainly Muslim women will. But as a whole, all of the values that took, you know, thousands of years for the West to develop, you, you dump some kid in daycare so that you can go and run the customer support hotline at some big box store. Your kid isn't learning those treasured, amazing values of tolerance, open-mindedness, free speech, uh, personal responsibility, free will, all of these great things that took untold amounts of struggle, strife, and war to, to create, you can just snuff that out yep. by just saying to women, well, you'll be more fulfilled at work. So From the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week when we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. Stefan Molyneux is the founder and host of Free Domain, the largest and most popular philosophy show in the world. With more than 4,500 podcasts, 10 books, and 600 million downloads, Stefan has spread the cause of liberty and philosophy to millions of listeners around the world. Prior to launching Free Domain, Stefan built a thriving career as a software engineer and executive. In 2007, he left his work in the tech industry to devote his efforts to spreading philosophy. Now a full-time parent and philosopher, Stefan has given speeches at liberty-themed events all over the world. His speeches cover subjects ranging from politics, philosophy, economics, relationships, parenting, and how to achieve real freedom in your life. Stefan is here to talk with me today about his work and about his having been deplatformed by YouTube and Twitter and what he's up to now. Welcome to the show, Stefan. Oh, thanks. A great pleasure to be back. It's been a it's while. It's so nice to see you again. It's been, it's been too long. It was a great conversation last time. I can't remember what we talked about. It must have been marriage related or parenting or something, right? My favorite something. topics. So nice to see you again. So I would like to start by assuming that the people who are listening to this don't know who you are and have them tell, have you tell them about you, who you are and how you ended up getting deplatformed after providing all this great content on the media with people like Jordan Peterson and George Rogan, uh, Joe Rogan. What happened? I don't even know that story. Well, first of all, I'd like to extend my condolences to anybody who doesn't know me yet because boy, have you missed out on a lot that there's really great, Amen. great material. Amen. So as far as why, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm pivoting a little here, right? So you can say deplatformed, but of course I'm talking to you. I'm on BitChute, I'm on Minds, I'm on Rumble. I'm, I'm all over the place now. In fact, I'm on more platforms now than I was before. So it's replatforming. Uh, that's all. You know, like if your house burns down, or rather in this case, if arsonists burn your house down, you don't just go and live on the street. You go find a new place to live. And yes. that's sort of where... As to the why I got deplatformed, Suzanne, I mean, they never tell you, right? I mean, it's like being ghosted by someone. I guess you, you had, a, 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 with YouTube, I had a relationship that went, I was like user number three or something like that back in 2006. And so I had like a 13 year relationship with YouTube, but never had any particular issues. And then, you know, there's supposed to be this whole process that you go through. Oh, you said something bad. There's a strike and then you can appeal. But it was just a complete, like total Maoist erasure of the person, like those guys in the Stalin pictures in the Soviet Union who just vanish uh, completely. So yeah, I just woke up to that. And then it was a week or two later, it was uh, Twitter. So um, the fact that it was shortly before the election, I'm sure is not entirely a coincidence because I did a lot of work in 2015, 2016, pushing back against the media lies about Donald Trump. And I did that because I don't like it when people lie. And also because the media had lied so much about me that, you know, but nobody's going to particularly care if they lie about me. But Donald Trump having a slight smidge of a profile higher than I do, uh, I wanted to push back so that people could see, yeah, the media lies about Donald Trump, therefore they lie in general, therefore when you read what the media says about me, you can take it with a grain of salt big enough to make Utah look like a salt lick. So uh, I did a lot of work on that. You know, Trump won by a small, like 70,000 votes, and I, you know, my pushbacks against the lies about Donald Trump hit millions and millions and millions of views, so maybe they felt there was some mm -hmm. influence 
to do with that. So I think that they were just kind of cleaning house. Uh, I was pushing back a lot against the George Floyd narrative and trying to get all the facts out about that. And of course, the every single year uh, that there's a major election in the U.S., they try and gin up this race hatred, these racial conflicts by lying about particular uh, issues. You know, Trayvon mm-hmm. Martin and George Zimmerman, I did a very popular video push, pushing back on that stuff. Uh, I was also doing a wide variety of other sort of pushing back against these race hatred narratives, which you know, may win you election, but in the long run, it's going to lose you the absolute damn republic as a whole. So uh, it's just a little bit of uh, pay me now or pay me later. So I think there was a lot of pushback coming from people about that. I wasn't dealing with any particularly new topics. I was pushing back a lot against uh, some of the lies around coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had also in uh, shortly before it emerged in China, I was uh, in Hong Kong. I I went out to Hong Kong to shoot a documentary in the uh, fall of 2019. And if I do say so myself, I think it was a great documentary. I interviewed the guy who wrote Hong Kong's constitution. I showed up on Uh, TV there and uh, just had a lot of great interviews and also marched with the anti-communist protesters, took a couple of facefuls of tear gas. It was all very exciting and a lot of uh, powerful footage and a lot of really great stuff. And um, that, before I got deplatformed from YouTube, that whole documentary just vanished. Like you couldn't find, even if you search for the name of it directly, it all just vanished. So of course that's pro-China stuff. It's protecting the CCP stuff. And of course, I was pushing back against this, uh, this, this weird bat virus just emerged spontaneously in the Wuhan fish market. It only happens to be 300 meters from the only level four bioweapons lab in all of China. And uh, so now, of course, you can say that Anthony Fauci says he doesn't think necessarily that it's uh, of natural origin. So, you know, I was just, I guess, annoying a lot of people um, with regards to telling the truth and, and following the facts wherever they led. Yeah, and so they um, they cordially invited me to find more productive outlets for my work. I suppose you could say. Oh, I, I'm I'm probably not far behind you at some point. It's just I, the only the closest I ever come is when I I touch upon um, anything feminist that's really strike you know striking, and then all of a sudden Facebook has like you know for, normally there'll be hundreds and hundreds of um, you know shares or likes or comments, and then boom zero, like nada, nothing. Like it makes no sense whatsoever. And then I've, it's always, it's always the same topic te- te- technically. So that's my small little way of, of identifying with, with what you're saying. Um, although I've dealt with it my whole career too, within mainstream media for sure. in in, in a larger way, um, in terms of, well, and of course, I who will cover in, what uh, the academic world. Yeah. I was in the academic world earlier and I didn't even get the chance to get deplatformed because there was so much hostility and opposition mm-hmm. to the anti-communist, anti-socialist, anti-fascist, anti-totalitarian aspect to what it is that I talk about that uh, I guess I should consider myself lucky to have even had a platform to be kicked off because yeah. you know, prior to the internet, that wouldn't have happened much at all, which is why I spend so much time in the business world where if you do a good job, you get rewarded. Whereas of course, in the, in the social media world, if you do a good job, you just tend to get punished. Yeah, uh, I had one experience being uh, disinvited from, from a college. And I decided I was not interested whatsoever in the whole college scene. I thought I wasn't really interested in it before, but I thought I told my husband, I'll just try it. I'll just see how I feel about it. It barely didn't even get that far because I was um, disinvited at last minute. So, Well, it's a really sad thing, too. It's a really sad thing. I mean, all all seriousness, uh, because there are lots of people I disagree with in the world. But that doesn't mean that I'm right and they're wrong. They may have a really good argument I haven't thought of. They may have really good data that I wasn't aware of. And I don't find myself frightened by or or wishing to tear out the tongues of people who say things I disagree with. They might have a great point. They also, through dialogue with me, might have their arguments improved. I might have my arguments improved. And that whole spark and friction, you know, how you sharpen a sword on that whetstone, there's all that spark and friction. That's what free speech is all about. Mm -hmm. If you have an idea that's bad, and you just try and crush it and destroy it and drive it from the public square, it radicalizes uh, people, which I think is a real shame because then they, you know, if, you, if you're kind of jumpy and paranoid and think that the mainstream culture is kind of toxic and anti whatever category you're in, and then, you know, people making that case using data and evidence get driven out of the public square, attacked, slandered, lied about, suppressed, and so on, it doesn't calm the waters of human discourse to drive people uh, underwater. Uh, it just, 
means that their ideas no longer can be engaged with. They can't be talked out of things. And it really does confirm whatever people are saying, critical of the mainstream, if the mainstream really tries to destroy people's lives, uh, it tends to fragment and create oppositional camps where we should all be coming together under the umbrella of reason and evidence. We should all be coming together and trying to find a, the way forward. The, the truth is a very slippery and difficult thing to get a hold of, and it's even tougher to keep with new data. And when you get people out of the conversation, uh, you just fragment society. And then you, you can see this happening on Twitter, for instance. You can see very clearly that the left follows people on the left, the right follow people on the right, the people who are into QAnon follow only QAnon, mm -hmm. the people, and, and the, the common Everyone's language, the Esperanto of reason that we're supposed to be communicating with is all being Tower of Babel fragmented. And this is especially hard for philosophers. Don't, I, I'm not a philosopher the way you are, but I loved philosophy in college. I mean, my favorite class was philosophy, but I just remember thinking, what the heck would I do with that? <laughs> but I could have sat there for four years and discussed it. That's how much I love it. And that, you know, being into philosophy requires, obviously, uh, uh, I don't even want to say duking it out, but just discussion, discussion. And if, and if the person's agreeing with you the entire time, it's not really much of a discussion. No, and it's the humility to know that other people might, might be as, in as great a possession or more possession of truth than you are. And that, that humility is really what drives forward the conversation. But you see, the problem is, this is why philosophers tend to get attacked so much, is that all power is based on a series of lies. Yep. And if you begin to unravel those lies, you begin to unravel power itself. And of course, the people who are surfing on the bloody waves of power don't particularly like it when you take the current no. out of their momentum. And so they all claim, this is all the way back to Socrates and the sophists, right? All the sophists claim to be in possession of the truth, of knowledge, of virtue, of wisdom. And they say, well, no, we're not interested in power. We're only interested in doing good. And of course, the big question that Socrates had is, well, how do you know that exactly? How, I, can you be sure of that? Or do you really know what justice and truth and wisdom and virtue are? because then you claim that to be the seat of your power. This is why you get to order people around with the force of law and because you're just so virtuous and know so much about, about goodness. So then of course, Socrates and, and myself, we begin to ask questions. Do I really know what virtue is? Do I really know what the truth is? Do I really know what morality is? And then after you examine those questions in yourself, you then begin to examine other people. And if the people in power are revealed as using the appearance of virtue in order to dominate and control you, well, that dominance and control becomes visible and people will recoil. They don't want to obey a fist. They don't want to mm -hmm. obey a gun. They will obey virtue. Mm -hmm. And so the pretense of virtue is the foundation of power. And when philosophers come along asking those inconvenient and uncomfortable questions about how it is that you know that, that you're right and good and virtuous and noble, well, it really just begun to unravel the smokescreen that covers the mailed fist of power and uh, they know likey, I think, if I can quote well, the ancient. I they know likey. Phrase. I guess I should brace myself then, because interestingly enough, my, my book that's coming out in August, um, the, it's in two parts. And part one is Four Lies the Culture Tells. And then it names the four lies. And then this part two is a 12 step program for young women for them to actually follow a path that will lead them to success in the personal domain rather than following the culture's lies. So it's, it's going to be interesting. Well, and these lies, I mean, I'm, I'm sure at least maybe one of the ones that, that you talk about, or maybe it's related, but the, the, these really contradictory lies, they invite people into a mentally ill state of mind, into almost like a psychosis. Mm -hmm. Like if someone were to come along to me and say, Steph, you can have it all. You can have a monogamous relationship, but still date anyone you want. You can spend uh, all your time at work and all of your time with your children. You can like... <laughs> These they would be like you Sounds can great. split yourself into twelve dimensions, right. or each of which right. operates a separate tunnel of time, and like it would just no. You're inviting me to a psychotic view of life that doesn't exist, and you're guaranteeing me absolute misery because I'm not going to be able to fulfill any of these particular ideals. And the you can have it all mentality is you don't need to make compromises. You can both save and spend at the same time. You can get older and wiser, but still get more youthful and limber as time goes forward. It's like, you're just inviting people to be mentally ill and not process reality. I know. And then 10 help? years later, they're co calling me for coaching because their lives are a mess, right? right? It's all, it's all gone awry because they followed this crap that they were fed. And I, it's so overwhelming to deal with it every day that I finally just said, oh, okay, we've got to have something for these women that they don't end up in this boat. That's the, but anyway, I don't want to talk about me. So let, so I have a question for you. So how do people hear the interviews that they used to watch on 
YouTube, or I don't know if they found them via Twitter now. If they want so to see. my website, freedomain.com is still running. You can go to freedomain.com forward slash connect and it lists all of the platforms that I'm, it's like a, I don't know, 15 or 17 platforms that I'm currently on. Some of them are like Twitter. Some of them are like Facebook. Some of them are like uh, YouTube and, yep. uh, and so on. So yeah, there's lots of different ways that people can still get what I'm doing. And, you know, if you haven't listened to me for a while, the one thing that is true about me, that's probably a bunch of things that are true about me, but one thing that's really true about me I'm pretty good in adversity. And so when I get deplatformed, I'm like, I'm just going to do even yep. better. My shows exactly. are going to be even better, more yep. concise, Love more uh, impassioned, more powerful, more useful. And so um, I'm, I switch to live streams to get more audience feedback as I go along. And uh, I'm working on a book at the moment. Sorry, it's kind of a oh, good. <laughs> segue. Okay. So I'm working on a book. Um, I actually, so I have an acting background and acting training, and I was originally a novelist and a playwright. So I took one of my novels and read it as a free audiobook. Uh, it's a really great novel. It's very long, but it's very good. It's about an English family and a German family, which is the two sides of my family history from World War I to World War II, uh, one on the English side, of course, one on the German side and how their lives intertwine and intersect. And uh, it's a very good novel about the rise of political violence. I wrote it over 20 years ago. Uh, but when I was rereading, it, I'm like, wow, I really did kind of nail this one, didn't I? Because, you know, we can see that happening now. If people want to get that, it's totally free. You can get freedomain.com forward slash almost. The name of the book is almost. But the new book I'm working on is about parenting. I've been a stay at home dad for 12 and a half years. Right. And how and... old is your, is you have a daughter, right? Yeah, yeah. She's, yeah, how uh, old well, she? she'll be 13 this year. Oh, just 13. Okay. She's just, yeah, just by just my 13. account, she's still young. Yeah. You, you yeah. tell her that and see if yeah. you get right. out of the room alive. <laughs> hey, you're only 13. I used to you're teach her age once cute, upon a time. Pat, pat, pat. Yeah. No, because you're close to Empty Nester now, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, August. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I've, I've, the philosophical principles, you know, I, in starting this book, Suzanne, I looked back over philosophers that I knew, and I mostly read philosophers for like metaphysics, epistemology, like nature of reality, nature of knowledge, and so on, and some, some to do with morals. You know, it's really tragic. Almost no philosophers talk about parenting or childhood really, really as a whole. It's an incredibly rare topic. And, you know, in some of the ancient Greek philosophers, well, because they were a bit sausage focused, uh, it was sort of clear to understand why they wouldn't necessarily be too keen on, on parenting as a whole. But, you know, philosophers really don't talk about parenting. And you're yet going the to. child, yeah, the child is the okay. father of the man. How do you take philosophical principles and apply them to the most important job that we have, which yep. is parenting? And yep. so I've been working on this book. Uh, I call it Peaceful Parenting. It's the non-aggression principle applied to parenting. No initiation of force, no threats. And we have this weird belief that, you know, for, for a relationship we, we choose, like getting married or, or boyfriend, girlfriend or friends or whatever, if the person is like really mean, mean to us, then we should just leave. We should just get out. We should just go and, and, and do our own thing. But somehow when it comes to parent-child relationship, the child doesn't choose. They don't choose to be there. They don't choose you as a parent and they can't leave. They're really trapped yeah. there for like mm -hmm. 20 years. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this should be the relationship that you have the highest moral standards in, and yet people just let their moral standards slip completely into total negative territory. Like if, if, if I was married to my, I'm married now, I've been for almost 20 years, but if my wife had been assigned to me by some village elder and, and she had no choice in the relationship and I wanted her to love me, I'd need to treat her the very best of all my relationships because I'd have to overcome the involuntary aspect of our relationship. You know, if you were currently conducting this interview with me and I was blinking Morse code hand signals because you had me locked in the basement, uh, you know, that would be kind of tough because I wouldn't be here by choice. And so where we have relationships, like with our kids, they're not there by choice. So we should treat them the very best. But somehow we go, well, they're not here by choice. Eh, they can't really leave. Yeah. They have to yeah. be with me forever. So I can just treat them badly yeah. or indifferently or neglect them. They're low on my list of priorities. And I'm like making the case like, no, 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 no. You have to treat them the best because they didn't choose to be here. And if you want a continued lifelong relationship with them, they should be subject to your very highest moral standards. And we've all seen this, you know, in families where the parents are, you know, snapping and snarling at the kids in the restaurant. And then the waiter comes by and the waiter says, oh, can I help you? And they're like, oh, very nice to see you. <laughs> yes, we think we might. It's like, why are you treating the waiter better than your own children? That makes no sense at all. The waiter's not going to be sitting there holding your hand while you slip into the eternal dark. They're not going to be wiping your butt when you can't find your keys at the age of 80. The waiter's coming and going and you're treating that waiter really well. And then you treat your kids badly. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, even as a kid, I couldn't, couldn't make sense of any of that stuff. So I'm sort of outlining the 
theory and practice, like the theoretical philosophical principles of peaceful parenting, and then like how you actually make it work in the real world. So yeah, I've been working on that for a while. When does that, when will you be finished with that? When does that come out? Well, I am about 20% done. So it'll be at least another couple of months. Okay. Okay. So I love how you now have, which I assume was in response to what happened with the the D platform, but maybe I'm wrong. a, A manifesto, I guess, of sorts on what you believe. Yes. Um, that's on the homepage for anybody who's listening. Uh, I mean, for anybody who wants to know where to find that, it's directly, I think, on the homepage of the Free Domain site. And I want to go through, you have a, a various topics here, the ones that you've been covering, I guess, for years. And I'm going to read basically what your your statement is or your pronouncement about that thing and then let you kind of go and we can chat about it. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. Your first one is reality. And the gist of it is that objective reality exists. Explain what you mean by that. Sounds kind it's of obvious. The, uh, so, me. I mean, philosophically speaking, there's a, René Descartes was, a, of course, a philosopher back in the day, a couple of hundred years ago, who was plagued by existential doubt. And we all under, is it a simulation? Is it real? Am I a brain in a tank uh, being manipulated by some demon with electrodes? You know, the matrix argument that the, that we're in some other different plane of existence and our sense data is kind of uh, implanted in us uh, in, in some external way. How do we know what's real? Well, that's pretty important because we can only meet people in reality. We can't meet people in fantasy. You don't get married to people in your dreams. You can't lend them money. <laughs> they can't, you know, cuddle with you in, in the real world. And so knowing what is real is foundational to mental health because our brains are designed to deal with reality, but our brains have a great capacity for unreality. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, we learn a lot through our dreams and our dreams are not real. And also there is like, we understand gravity at a theoretical level and gravity exists in the real world, but the theory of gravity doesn't, you know, um, uh, we understand, you know, you and I may be a hundred kilometers apart, and the physical distance exists, but there's not like a hundred markers in the world. So we're always slicing and dicing up the world according to our conceptual absolutes. Now those conceptual absolutes don't exist in reality. Now they should describe reality accurately, but they're unreal in a way. Again, they should be accurate and objective, but our mental constructs like the scientific method or uh, grammar or, or distance and so on, time even, well, it's, very abstract, it's very unreal, but it's incredibly powerful when it actually aligns with the facts of reality. Like we can send a probe to Jupiter or even further out of the solar system if we understand the universals of gravity. And again, gravity exists all over the universe, but our concepts, the mathematical formulas, those are mental constructs that don't exist in the same way in the universe. So how do we know that we're not just a brain in a tank? Because you know, you and I, we're having this conversation, we're looking at each other, we're listening to each other, but our brains aren't touching. Our brains are very distant. Even if we were in the same room, we could press foreheads, I guess, if we wanted to do some Siamese twin uh, example, but we can't merge our brains. All that we can do is send you know, sound and visual signals to each other through our ears and our eyes. And so knowing that there are parts of your brain that are unreal, dreams and some of our concepts and so on. And there are parts of your brain that are processing things that are very real and immediate. Making sure that your concepts actually align with reality is really important. There's no such thing as the physics of dreams. Because, you know, when you're in dreams, you can can fly, you can walk through fire, you can breathe underwater, you can do all kinds of cool things that don't actually work in the real world. So the first job of philosophy is to teach you what is real and what is objective. And there are ways to do that, right? So the, what you look for is you look for consistency, right? The one thing that happens in dreams is inconsistency is kind of the, the whole, that's how you know you're dreaming when you wake up. And you look for consistency, you look for universality, you look for reproducibility. You know, if, if, you, um, uh, if you go, if there's a, a tree in your backyard, then you should be able to go there every day and, and see the tree. And your eyes should guide your fingers to touch the tree. And if you see the tree and you touch the tree and you smell the tree and you know, you can peel back the bark, then you know that it's a real and objective thing. Whereas of course, if you're asleep in your, uh, in your bed at night and and you dream that there's a tree in your backyard, then it turns into a soldier, then it bursts into flame, then it turns into a flock of of seagulls and so on. Then you know that it doesn't have the consistency that objective reality. So consistency is the theme 
Of yeah, consistency, universality, reproducibility, yeah. all the stuff that's part of the scientific method. And that's how we can really root our beliefs in, in the real and the objective and that which exists outside your mind. And okay. things also not subject to your whim. I can choose yeah. to think of one thing. I can choose to think of another thing. I can close my eyes and imagine various creatures dancing in front of my orange vision, but I can't walk through a tree in my backyard, no matter how much I will it. So some things we can control with our minds and some things we can't. And that's one of the big dividing lines between what's objective and real and what is subjective and not. Okay. And I'm going to name these, these topics before I continue really quick. So, so people know where I'm headed. Virtue, the state, race, men and women and the family. And you know, I want to get to men and women, the family, most of all, <laughs> right. uh, I know, you know that. So let's go quicker through the, the other ones. So we can get to that one. Um, virtue. I love this because you, uh, well, you, the way you put it is virtue is simply universally preferable behavior. And within that context, you write morality must be universal. And this made me think of, um, this made me think of um, the 1960s when the universal moral order began to really be turned on its head in, 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 in favor of moral relativity. So if you could talk about this with respect to that, that would be great. Well, of course, the Christian inheritance in Christianity is one of the only religions that has universal ethics. Most of religions are in-group tribal preferences. In other words, I owe morality to another follower of the same religion, but not to outsiders. In fact, I may not care or even have negative moral obligations towards outsiders. So Christianity is the true universal philosophy. Now, uh, sorry, theology. Now philosophy, we can't just say, well, God said it therefore, right? We have mm -hmm. to have the reason and the evidence. So I spent uh, quite a long time. I do. Not on. everybody does. I don't think, but some people, I mean, some right. people I guess are good with just, just cause God said so, but that's. Well, but not philosophy, right? So philosophy yeah. is oh, a I different see. discipline mm -hmm. than theology. And so with philosophy, we have to find a way to justify universal moral standards. And again, remember I was saying like the concepts in our mind don't necessarily exist in the world. The scientific method is a great way for learning about reality, but the scientific method doesn't exist in the real world. It's a mental construct and concept. So morality doesn't exist in the world. Now, if you say moral rules come from God and you accept and believe that, then you've got your morality right there. But if you are a skeptic towards that yeah. epistemology, then you have to have a philosophical justification. Yeah. So people can check it out. I won't go through all the arguments here, but Universally Preferable Behavior is a book that I wrote uh, 13 years ago, and it's, I've debated it a whole bunch of times with a lot of skeptics. It really holds true. It really can't be overturned. And it's a way of justifying morality without reference to divine commandments and without reference to secular laws, right? Because that's just pointing a gun at people and saying that you're moral, but back to the Socrates versus the Sophists argument. So yeah, university has to be moral. Uh, morality has to be universal. Otherwise, it's something else. You know, I like blue, you might like the color red. Okay, so that's aesthetics. That's not universal because it's not like blue is objectively better than red. Subjective taste in, in art, music, food, sex, whatever it is that, that's going on, that's uh, something which everyone can have their own practice. They're not imposed on others, but it's stuff we impose on others. You know, if I believe in property rights and steal something from me, I have the right to use force to get it back. Like, I can't Im violently impose my preference for the color blue on you because then I'm just a violent jerk. But you know, if a woman says, look, I have bodily autonomy, I own my own body. Then if you go and rape her or you want to go and rape her, she can use violence to enforce her belief. And that's morality and violence go hand in hand. And this is why we want to have a morality that's not initiating the use of force. That's really self-defense in an extremity is fine, but you don't want to have a morality that initiates the use of force, you want to have a morale, but we have to understand that morality and violence go hand in hand because morality is the stuff where we say, yeah, if you violate this, we're going to lock your ass in prison for 10 years. If you go beat someone up, if you go murder someone, if you rape someone, if you steal, you go to jail. And if you resist going to jail, we get to shoot you if you violently resist being arrested and so on. And so recognizing that morality is the other side, the flip side of the coin of violence you have to be really careful how you define morality. Like if you say, well, inequality is immoral, then you get to use violence until everyone's equal. Well, no, nobody ever will be perfectly equal at all times and under all, so you've just given people a license for infinite violence. And, and if you say, well, everybody has to have the same income and everybody has to have equal access to owning the means of production and so on, 
or you know, I was reading your article about Melinda Gates, who's like, you know, well, we don't, we've never achieved true equality, and that's terrible. And it's like, well, the moment that you have a morality that is impossible to achieve, you've just yeah. given people an infinite license to use violence. And that's why these things are so dangerous. And that's why it's so important to define morality in as narrow a set of circumstances as possible, because otherwise you're just giving people license to kill. That's what's happening right now with the BLM movement in America, right? Yeah, yeah. They're saying, look, if, if we are unequal for, for whatever reason, right, then we get to use violence until we are. Uh, yeah. That's not, I mean, that's communism as a whole, right? Inequality mm -hmm. always results from evil bigotry and therefore infinite violence is, is, is perfectly morally acceptable. In fact, it's required. It's required that you use violence to gain equality. But the purpose of communism is simply to allow people to be violent. It's not to gain equality because they never do gain equality, but they just no, keep right. going. It's just a cover right. story it's, for it's, it's a endless, pathological it's endless sadism. Loop. Yeah. Um, okay, so this kind of leads somewhat, I guess, into the state. Or you said this, um, uh, let's see. Well, you you were talking about philosophy does not recognize geography or beliefs um, and the law of physics do not change from one country to the next. But what I have highlighted here is where you said people calling themselves the government claim the moral right to, oh no, it cut off, initiate? Yeah, to initiate the use of force against others. Yeah, other, others, which is kind of what we're talking about. They do not possess this right. A moral society is a stateless society. So the universal application of the non-aggression principle means like if I just put on a blue costume, I don't get to violate the laws of physics. Like there's no blue costume that lets me breathe underwater or fly or anything like that. So the non-initiation of the use of force is foundational to a universal morality. And so people in the government, though, of course, they say, well, we live in this particular building or we have this particular costume or we've written on a piece of paper that we have, we have this particular ability and therefore they get to initiate the use of force against others. Philosophy does not recognize the concept of a government that allows people to exempt themselves from universal moral rules. It would be literally be like saying, I have a flying club. It's like, oh, do you have planes? No, <laughs> it's just, we have a club called the flying club, which allows us to fly. It's like, well, no, you can't fly because you can't violate the laws of physics and you're heavier than air. So this, creation of concepts that allow for opposite moral standards is really the most dangerous and pathological aspect of modern philosophy, really philosophy throughout history. I mean, that used to say, well, God has given me dominion over you as the king or as the aristocrat, and therefore I get to violate uh, uh, your property rights and, and take stuff from you and so on. Uh, or I get to sleep with your wife on our wedding day or something like that because I've got this magical category called aristocrat or, or king and so on. Well, we, we know that that's invalid, but then all we did was switch it to Congress and democracy and the politicians and so on. And it's like, that's the purpose of power is to create some category that justifies everything you would deny to your subjects. You, you, like you and I, we can't say, oh, I'm kind of poor, so I'm just going to go around with a gun and take stuff from people. Well, that's, that would be theft and being poor wouldn't justify it. However, the welfare state, which is the government using force to transfer property from one group to another while keeping the lion's share for themselves. Well, that's exact. That would be barred for you and I, but somehow it's morally yeah. fine for people in the government to do it. But philosophy is universal. Morality is universal. You can't just create a category and say, well, I can now do the opposite. Like, well, you can, of course, but it's not Morally right. valid, and of it's course, not justified. And of course, going back to what we were saying a second ago about BLM and this next category is race. That's exactly what's being done in the name of race as we speak. I would say that BLM is much more in the name of Marxism than it is. A race is kind of the excuse. Yeah. But uh, I mean, the, the founders all tend to be on the Marxist side and, and some of them very explicitly so. And of course, a lot of people who are blacks or, or, or uh, other racial or ethnic groups reject it because they don't like the Marxist element. So um, yeah, race is kind of like, like it used to be class, you know, yeah. the feminists use gender, the Marxists yep. used to use class, but uh, of course Marxism predicted that there would only be rich and poor, no middle class. And that prediction got blown out of the water uh, as the development of capitalism swelled the middle class most of all. So they had to switch to something other than class to create conflict. And so they decided to switch to race. This was uh, in the uh, uh, 1923, 1924. So they said that our future goal is not to antagonize classes or set classes against each other, but to set races against each other. And uh, so I think that that intersection is probably 
better at explaining BLM than, than most things. Okay. Well, you wrote in here, which I think is really, uh, I mean, it would be considered controversial in some circles, but it's, it's to you and me, it's just dealing with objective truth, as you say. You said, I do not believe that any race is superior or inferior. I accept the biological facts that some ra racial differences exist because philosophy teaches us to accept facts, even if they make us uncomfortable. So, and then you gave an example of, um, uh, or was it, although there are many talented Chinese basketball players who would not expect the majority of those players to be Chinese. Um, I mean, wait, did I say that right? We were not yeah, I mean, I think yeah, that's yeah. A, a good analogy. Yeah, for sure. There, there are differences yeah. between the races. And again, you never judge any individual by general exactly. racial I was characteristics, gonna, yeah, right. of course. Right. But when you zoom out but enough. You make any generalization, though, is what yeah. I'm getting at. You get, that's you how get, we live. Bit, how, your mean, head chewed off. You, you could, I mean, I love how you make a blank, not you, how one makes a blank, uh, not a blank statement, makes a generalization. And then someone said, oh, yeah, but my mom or this happened or I didn't have this experience, which completely. I know a smoker who lived to be 100. Yes, it's that's like, my favorite. Come on. That's, yeah, yeah, like that know, completely negates it. the generalization. Yeah, you know, women so, tend to be shorter than men. Wait a minute. It's so I know scary. a tall woman. It's like, oh, you've just disqualified yourself from a rational and conversation then, now, haven't you? And then I want to say to them without being insulting, like, do you really honestly believe that your one example negates the the the, the observation or 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 do you do you think they drew truly do believe that I, I mean i just can't get my head around it it's so dumb well then i would just suggest to people that they start an insurance company and don't charge different rates for smokers versus non-smokers that's yeah. all you have to do because hey some smokers are going to outlive non-smokers so clearly you can't make any generalizations about the life expectancy of smokers versus non-smokers so you yeah. could just make a fortune by starting an insurance company and not differentiating between smokers and non-smokers and see how that goes there you go there you go. Love it. Okay. So now we get to my favorite topic. And you dun, know dun, what that is. <laughs> Sorry, that needed some dramatic music, I felt. Okay. I'm going to read what you wrote here about men and women. And now that my ears of my listeners are perking up here since that's what we talk about all the time. Okay. Women and men have faced different evolutionary pressures. Just as in the case of race, this does not mean men or women are superior. One is superior or inferior. They have evolved based on the preferences as mates, just as men of women have evolved, sorry, based on preferences, just as men have evolved based on preferences of women. I oppose ideologies that strive to pit women against men. Amen. But of course, I don't know how you feel about this or not. I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether you agree with this or not, but I, I truly believe that is the overarching problem that we're dealing with today, unquestionably. Because once you divide the two sexes, yes, the two sexes that exist, you've got a massive problem because the fallout for that is just enormous. And so the, 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 um, the positive way, the appropriate way to handle it is, as you've written here, to understand that we each need to work together as a team and that we need each other and that that is the ultimate goal. And if you are living in a culture that we're living in today where, where men and women are being pit against each other. That obviously means people aren't going to get together. That obviously means families aren't going to be created. We, we already know now the, the birth rate that just came out a couple of weeks ago, right? Is the lowest it's ever been yeah. um, in over a century. This is massively, this is massive. Oh, it's, it really is. I mean, I think you're right, Suzanne. It's the most heartbreaking thing that's going on in the moment. Because, you know, abstract considerations of statism and, and, and race and so on. But, I mean, we're talking about love. We're talking mm -hmm. about connection. We're talking about comfort into your old age. We're talking about the joys yes. of raising children. And a lot of people are facing, yeah, it's an overused cliche, an existential crisis. They don't know what they're living for. They don't know what the meaning of life is. It's like, well, yeah, because women won't transmit cultural values anymore. They mm -hmm. simply won't as, as a collective, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Christian women will and other groups of women will and certainly Muslim women will. But as a whole, all of the values that took, you know, thousands of years for the West to develop, you, you dump some kid in daycare so that you can go and run the customer support hotline at some big box store. Your kid isn't learning those treasured, amazing values of tolerance, open-mindedness, free speech, uh, personal responsibility, free will, all of these great things that took untold amounts of struggle, strife, and war to, to create, you can just snuff that out. 
yep. by just saying to women, well, you'll be more fulfilled at work. So, you know, I worked in a daycare and all, all that we, I worked in a daycare for years as a teenager. Most of what we did was just try and have the kids not fight too yep. much, but we yep. sure as heck weren't transmitting any particular values because the moment you did, some parent would get upset and, and all this kind of stuff. So of course people, men are feeling despair, women are feeling depressed and progressively unhappier because we got nothing to give to our kids. We've got no kids to give them to. So what's the point of accumulating wealth if you can't hand it on? What's the point of accumulating virtue if you can't instill it in your kids? What's the point of gathering everything together? Why would you bother saving anything if you knew it was all gonna get stolen from you? Why as a farmer, if you knew that there were horsemen coming to rob you of everything, would you sweat for months to produce the most crops? Of course not. Everything is evaporating in our hands because we can't get women to transmit the cultural values we've accumulated because they get tempted by making two dollars on the money, yeah, $2 money dollars per hour after childcare costs. So yeah, we're all pretty despairing about this, I think. And I so my argument has always been that so much of this is about so so, gosh, if this was ever not proven last year with COVID, I don't know what has. But people are sheeple, right? People are sheeple. So. The, and I and I actually don't mean that in the, in as of a disparaging way that I just made it sound. I, I truly just believe that people are most comfortable doing what the people around them are doing. That's it. End of story. That's just how they, that's how human nature is. So fewer people are going to stand out doing their own thing if nobody else around them is doing it. It's just very difficult to do. So that's always been sort of the basis of my argument for why um, things are working out as they are. Because when you have that uh, drumbeat coming from above every single day in every different arena that that you, that you should prioritize your career over marriage and family. Um, as you can see, that's exactly what people will do. And so I'm hope I don't know. I mean I'm I know I'm not a fatalist. So um, and of course I have this book coming out this year, which is basically telling women to do the exact opposite. So I'm hoping to have some some effect there. But I feel like with this birth rate and with the way things are going in the country right now. It, it it can only go up and from here. And I don't know if that's just my mindless optimism or what, but I, it's either we literally die out or we get the message and, and recalibrate. What do you think is going to A happen? glorious future awaits. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I Am I just a Pollyanna? No, no, no. Oh, Listen. Yeah. Okay. So, oh boy, where do we even begin? So, a, a lot of this, the feminism is driven by fiat currency, right? So if you yes. can just make up money and, and pretend that you're adding value, then you can subsidize a whole bunch of nonsense that you otherwise couldn't subsidize, right? And so, and we saw this with COVID, right? With COVID, a lot of women left the workforce and came home and enjoyed spending time with their kids. And it kind of shook them out of their stupor, yes. right? And, and yes. they were like, wow, you know, this is actually kind of yes. nice. It's relaxed. It's fun. I get to spend time with my kids. Uh, and, and then it's like, you, you now can go back into commuting for two hours a day and go sit in an office. They're like, oh, I'm enjoying homeschooling. It's like, it's really great fun. The, the family's running much better. My husband's happy. My kids are happy. My life is better. I'm actually shocked into a kind of happiness. And women are writing about this like they've discovered the Rosetta Stone. Like, dear Lord, the, the lives that our grandparents had was great. You know, like they've just they've made some amazing I, yeah. Indiana Jones discovery yeah. and, and, and run away under hail of poison blow darts from the natives or something. And it's glorious. Of course, it's completely predictable. When the fiat system runs out of steam, which is going to, and we've got some Bitcoin economy coming down the road for sure, then all of these weird subsidies are just going to evaporate. And when you can't get all these weird subsidies that prop up women's value in the workplace, then they will actually have to make a rational economic calculation about their value of working versus raising kids. And when that happens, we'll simply revert to, yeah, women are going to need resources. They're going to yeah. enjoy raising kids. Men are going to go out and work. And it's going to return to exactly how we evolved from that standpoint. And uh, I think everyone's going to be uh, just about infinitely better off. Oh, good. I feel so much better now that you've said that. <laughs> No, if we have to wait for politicians to do it, it's never going to happen. Know. But well, I know. But then, what do you? So, so do you feel like what's happening right now with the um, look? The administration we have in there right now is is obviously wants women out of the home and into the workforce, and all the kids in daycare. We know that they just, yeah. just put out that policy. Okay, or not policy, but proposal. Um, how much do you think that actually affects what goes on versus just a lot of hype and just a matter of oh no, it affects. Kind of I thing? mean. In terms of women's individual decisions, I mean now. Yeah, like, it absolutely affects individual decisions because governments know what they're doing. 
And it's not, of course, just coming from governments. It's coming from every single, every single piece of media you can get yes, a hold of right. is women that, going off to college yeah. and having great lives yeah. and sleeping around and traveling yep. around and being Bingo. joyful and happy and satisfied with a life of loose morals, cheap sex, no kids, yep. no responsibilities, lots of savings, sex in the city, wine on the patio. Uh, you know, there's never any mention of unwanted pregnancies or STDs or stalkers or, and then what happens is there's this great ghosting of women over 40. Boom, Whoosh, they're yep. gone, baby. I mean, maybe you'll drag out a semi-mummified Elizabeth Hurley to star in some nonsense about British royalty and so on. But these women, are just, boom, they're gone. They evaporate. They're like nuclear shadows scrubbed off the walls because you can't show women what happens on the downsides of 40. It's another reason I got yeeted off Twitter was I was sort of pointing out, hey, ladies, you're going to live to be 80. You don't have any kids after 40. You're going to lose a lot of male attention. What are you going to do with those four decades? That's mm -hmm. a long time. A long time. And all these women are saying, oh, but I turned 40 and I became invisible. Not if you had kids, you didn't. Yeah. Not if you had a husband, not if you had, you'd be a beloved matriarch. You'd have companionship all the way through to your old age. But guess what? Dating and sex is about fertility and children. And if you can't provide fertility yep. and children, men aren't going to be as interested in you unless it's like really low rent men that you're going to feel like you have to really lower your standards. Any high quality, high value man is going to settle for a younger woman, less baggage, fewer, uh, da less damage, less debt. And so, yeah, you've got to hide all of these broken women sailing off the, the lemming cliff of feminism and you've got to propagandize people like crazy and Oh yeah, it's. Uh, it's I have rough. a question for you. This is more yeah. of a philosophical end of this. Then, so what, in your opinion? I kind of said what I think when I opened it by saying people are sheeple and they're more co most comfortable with that. I think that's the reason. To me, that's what I think. But you, like, there's nothing that could happen in the government or in the country that would affect me against what I wanted to do, right? And I could say the same thing about my daughter. And and I wonder now, is that solely because of the way I raised her? Um, we raised her, I should say, it, because we specifically counteracted the messages that are coming mm. at her every single year for her entire, she's 21 now, for her entire life with us. And I, my argument has been to parents, that is the only recourse you have, right? Now, it doesn't mean they're going to necessarily agree with you or listen or follow suit, but at least you've done what you can do. Do you, do you agree that that's what's necessary because there's always going to be a smaller component of women who are going to not be affected by that, like me, who I just went and did my thing anyway, or, or like, what is that that makes some people affected by that and others not, I guess is my question. In your uh, um, so as far as childbirth goes, uh, you know, it, there's this kind of uh, meme about the IQ bell curve, right? Which is uh, like people uh, on the very left of the IQ bell curve say, you know, Bitcoin has value because people want it, right? And then people at the really smart end of the, the, the um, bell curve say, you know, Bitcoin has value because it's the convenience of digital, but it's also scarce and it's going to replace fiat. And people in the middle are saying, well, Bitcoin doesn't have value because it's just an electronic piece of puffery or something. The same thing's true of birth rates, right? So I think people at the very low end of the IQ spectrum, because of the welfare state, they have a better life and make more money by having children than going to get a job. Yes, Because, yes, you know, they may sure. not be able to get for a great sure. job, but they have a bad boss, and it's not, they don't have much to move up because they don't have a lot of cognitive ability. It's not an insult. It's just like saying somebody's short. It's not yep. an insult. It's just kind of a fact, right? And so at the lower end of the IQ spectrum, you're going to have a, a lot of kids. Now, at the high end of the IQ spectrum, I mean, I think I'm kind of up there. I think you're kind of up there. I mean, parenting is, is a great joy. You get to see the, the – it's like watching – Atlantis rise from the ocean, watching personalities and minds develop from these little blobs of nothing that, that get born. It's a, a beautiful, Correct. amazing, you know, the first time your kid corrects you or catches you out in a hypocrisy and it's just like, oh, good, that's incredible because <laughs> you know where they came from, right? Yeah. And so there's that great joy as well. But you know what? What I find tragic is all the people in the middle, all the people in the middle. They're yes, not okay. smart enough yeah. to really overcome the propaganda but they is have too much potential it, to just... Is it smart, Stefan, or is it confidence? I mean... Go on. <laughs> well, I always thought about it with respect to just knowing yourself and what you want and not being swayed by others, which I never really associated with IQ per se, mm. but just street smarts. I don't know. A, a, I don't know. Just confidence. That's all I ever thought about. Like, I've always been a very confident person and it runs in my family. Um, and, and, and we're not really affected by what people think. And I, I think that's unusual, but I never understood why it's unusual for me or my family. 
Yeah, I mean, the difference that I've seen, Suzanne, is that people who believe that society is basically good, like government and, and the politicians, they're basically good and looking out for your best interests. Those people tend to be kind of dragged along by the sort of lemming-like flow. The people who are like, hmm, I don't know, historically, governments have not really been super into the long-term welfare of their own people, right? Yeah. And I, so I remember being in grade seven. I was in grade seven. And there was some teacher who was talking about uh, old age pensions, right? Old age pensions. And oh, you kids, you know, you're going to grow up and you're going to get your old age pensions. And half the class just burst out in laughter. Like, of course, we're not going to get our old age pensions. We knew that the government was crazy in debt. Even at that age, it was all over the newspapers. Every time you flipped on the news, it was, oh, man, new levels of government debt, new levels of blah, blah, blah. 40 cents on the dollar going to pay interest on the national debt. Like, you knew that and, and we were just kind of laughing at the guy like we know it's a scam we know it's for the boomers to get rich and we're going to end up taking it in the shorts they're going to take money from us and there's no money being set aside for our retirement it's all being used to buy votes in the here and now and all that so if you have that kind of view which is yeah you know politicians kind of looking out for themselves and they'll tell you that they care about you but you know it's their own money and power and prestige that they're really into and so if you have that filter when the politicians say oh you should do this or here's the way this side or society as a whole it's like yeah i don't really i don't really buy it but of course the people who think you know the welfare state is is it's just it's society's manifestation of the charitable impulse to help the less fortunate yeah. blah 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 blah. they'll go with it yeah and i think that ultimately and again you might feel differently but i think that ultimately gets passed around the dinner table it's like whatever you were whatever your parents not that every child agrees with their parents on these things but in general, I find that Democrats come from Democrats, for example, um, or conservatives from conservative liberals from liberals, and that the mindset is passed on, which of course plenty of people do reject it and go the other way. But in general, it's sort of like what your parents raised you with is kind of where your head is. I, I, that's what I see in my little world. Oh, it's, uh, I was just talking about this with a friend of mine the other day. Like, it's actually kind of terrifying how much power of yeah. your child's development you have yes. as a parent. Amen. You know, and I'm, I'm constantly aware, I don't want to teach oh, my God. daughter any conclusions that I have, I just want to teach you the process uh, yes. of thinking. Yep. And, and I was going pause you there really quickly because I'm constantly saying, we always said to our kids, because my husband and I feel so strongly, but we always counteracted it with, but you don't have to agree with, <laughs> agree with right, us. You can right. think what you want, but we just, it's really hard not to agree with us because we're so emphatic about it, but we always wanted to make sure they had their own mind. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> no, that's, it's a big thing. You, yeah. you have so much influence over the, so much. In, in, the information, the arguments, the exposure that your kids have that you really, really have to be careful that you're not just trying to rubber stamp your own brain Amen. onto a new yep. being because that's completely unfair to their individuation. Totally. And it also says, well, I'm right and your yep. new yep. perspectives can't be wrong. And I was, you know, born and propagandized like everyone else. And then in my mid-teens, I began to discover philosophy, began to undo the damage mm. that propaganda had given me. I like to think that my daughter has been raised without 15 years of, you know, mental bludgeoning. So yep. she can hopefully be a little sharper than me in these areas. And she does catch me out in contradictions and hypocrisies, which I think is wonderful so yeah that that amount of influence that you have and this is why again you you, you dump your kids in daycare they're just not going to get that nope. they're not nope. going to get that they're going to get pulled off each other being told to share be nice you know fifty thousand times a day but no actual sharpening of the mind no engaging in debate no uh processing of nope. of rational concepts nothing like that it's just it's just wrangling it's all, all you can do is, is manage the lowest common denominator from beating up everyone else and that gets into the, the family, which is your, the next um, uh, category, because, gosh, that is just, it's, it is scary what you just said. It is true about the influence. And I, 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 the way I've always felt is that I'm on a stage. I've been on a stage for 20 years where every move I make, especially in my relationship with their dad, is being absorbed. And I guess that's a good thing in a way if you're conscientious enough to be aware of that and make sure that you do what's best. But... I'm not sure that that is common. I think we get just carried away when our relationships and we're not really thinking about how it's affecting our children, but literally they have a front row seat to your marriage. And yeah, oh, sorry, I know we want to get it up, but one thing I wanted to mention here is, is what you do is you generally, most people would generally neglect in particular the moral education of their children and then be utterly shocked when the peer group takes over at the age of 13. It's like, no, 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 no. The yep. whole point of parenting is to prepare them for the onslaught yep. of the peer group. Because nature oh, yeah. points them horizontal oh, yeah. when they get to when they get to be teens, nature's pointing them horizontal because they need to find someone to have a baby with over time. They don't care about the parents. We're we're a stage that gets jet jettisoned like some old rocket on an Elon Musk penis substitute, right? So 
it's you know this I think idea. There's that, a lot of genuine confusion, Stefan. Maybe in your book that you have coming out, that'll that'll that corrects it or something. But there's a lot of confusion about when. Like, I don't think people realize, parents realize how much influence they have when their kids start to pull away, for example. Yes, you're right. The kids come, their friends become front and center. But that doesn't mean you just back off for eight years because you, nothing you say matters. That's not the point at all. You know, that kind of thing. So hopefully, I, I just think there's a lot of misinformation there when it comes to parenting and how yeah, it, and everything that you're doing is preparing for the teen storms. You know, yeah. the, the, the hormones, the height, the passion, the peer, you've got to have a strong foundation yep. so that uh, your, your kids have some backup against the onslaught of peer subjugation, which is and, perfectly natural in our evolution. And, yeah, and so many people who haven't parented uh, deliberately and consciously and, and created those bonds and those relationships are like, the, the peers what? are stealing my kids. It's like, no, you gave them away, man. Yeah, bingo. I mean, whatever you did in those early years, either... Um, uh, uh, um, embolden what you're going to do in later years or it will it will weaken it and that's or or if you don't resist peer pressure as a parent how on earth are your yes. kids supposed oh to resist God. peer pressure as a kid on that one well mom oh. had to go to work because that's what everyone did it's like oh so we just do what everyone does i guess i'll go with my peer group then right. down some horrible tunnel right right or you do drugs and then you wonder why your kids do or whatever right what you are setting the model that's that's it that's just how it works like you know i didn't make the rules it's just how it is and We're i guess printing maybe species it's, Maybe it's, I mean, it's designed, I think, I mean, I think in my existential mind, I guess, that that's why that's what makes us as parents, that's what makes the job harder, but then maybe keeps us in line, right? Like if we're, in other words, if we know we're being watched as opposed to not being watched, wouldn't that potentially make us better people, make us try to be better people for their oh, sake? Oh, there's nothing that cures hypocrisy like being a parent and having your kids catch you out on stuff. Yeah, right. Oh, it's, it's, it's rough, man. But, you know, that's where the growth comes from. And this is why a lot of people want to postpone it, because you, you can keep your own self-image pretty intact until you have kids around there just with your, you know, with their big hammers smashing at your glass edifice of self-worship. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. It's pretty instructive. That. I, mean, oh I, was playing, I was playing this online game. Just yesterday, I was playing this online game with my daughter. And I was kind of annoyed because the other team was just beating us senseless and just kept scoring and kept scoring. And it's like, dude, we get it. You know, you're good, right? So then a couple of games later, we were doing the same thing to some other team. And I was like, yeah, right. We're winning. And my daughter was like, well, wait a minute. When, when they were thrashing us, that was a negative thing and it was annoying. But now we're thrashing them. Suddenly, this is a great thing. And it's like, ooh, busted. <laughs> that's exactly what I mean. Exactly. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's a reciprocal relationship, I guess, right? Yeah. And wait yeah, till well, they get you know, even older. Wait till they're even older. Wait till they're 20, Stefan. <laughs> Well, this is the thing, you know, my daughter is now better than me at some video games, Suzanne, which basically just reminds me that she's here. She's not here as a joyful gift to my life, at least not only she's here to replace me because I'm going to be fading off and she's going to need to be here because I won't be. And it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, there's that part of things, too. Oh, my gosh. OK. Um, and then we're going to close it out then, Stefan, with the last one, which is free will. And free will, you write, is our ability to compare proposed actions to ideal standards such as science or morality or truth. But let's just talk about this in a very simple, <laughs> a simple way that people can understand. And for me, free will is just we all have free will at the end of the day, right? We have free will. And what does yeah, that mean? Yeah, but see, in philosophy, that's called the tautology. What is free will? Something we all have. What do we all have? <laughs> free will. Uh, so I'm afraid while that may be satisfying for you, you expound, emotionally, then. intellectually, I'm afraid I got to, I got to Zorro that thing up a little bit. I'm afraid so, <laughs> but okay. yeah, so you have, yeah, comparing, we have to have some ideal standard, which is why I, you know, when people don't give you any kind of moral standard or ideal standard, you really don't have free will. Like when I think when I was younger, before I got philosophy, I was in this like haze of like, well, what do I do? Well, I guess I want to conform to my peers, but at the same time, I want to have my own thoughts, but I want to pursue this particular pleasure and avoid that particular. I was just like mm -hmm. an animal, like a mammal, just bouncing around from yeah. conformity to pleasure to pain avoidance to, you know, you get philosophy, then you can say, okay, now I got truth, universality, consistency. I got these things to aim for. And then I can compare something I want to do to an ideal standard and that that gives the without the ideal standard we've got nothing to compare to because the big question mm -hmm. in philosophy it comes from an old story about a philosophy professor someone came in how's your wife and he said compared to what and it's like that's a good question right compared to angelina jolie well uh, she's uh less pretty but has more boobs i don't know whatever the the comparison would be right 
So compared to what is important. So I'm going to make a choice compared to what? Compared to someone else's preference, what my hormones are telling me, compared to what? Now, if you have an ideal standard, now the ideal standard could be, we have all these great values as a society. I happen to have flourished in large part because these values and standards like you know, free speech and, and free markets and so on were maintained for hundreds of years at great expense to people. So because I benefited from these standards, I should do my part to pay them forward, right? Mm -hmm. and, and people got really, really mad at me. There's another thing that happened on Twitter where I would say, um, you know, what are you going to do with, with all of this time if you don't have kids, right? And, and the women would write back, you know, well, I'm going to get two PhDs and I'm going to study Mandarin and I'm going to make love to my husband and I'm going to travel. And blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, great till COVID hits, right? But, but here's the thing. So I would write back and I would say, so you have a great life. You, you're planning and having a wonderful, great, exciting, sensual life. And you're too selfish to give that forward to someone else. It ends with you. Your parents raised you to have this wonderful life and you're not going to raise anyone else to enjoy it because it just is going to interfere with your enjoyment. That's like inheriting a, a, a fortune that has lasted for, I don't know, four billion years and then just blowing it all on your own coke habit in, in one generation. That's so selfish, right? And so if you don't have a higher standard, yeah, I mean, it's, as you know, not always the most convenient thing to be a parent. There's lots of things that you want to do other than watch Toy Story 2 for the 300th time that weekend, right? But if you enjoy your life, then you should want to pay it forward because the only reason you and I are alive to enjoy our lives is because our parents Somebody sacrificed did. some yeah. stuff to have us. Like, why wouldn't you want to pass that joy of life forward to the next generation? You just selfishly hoard it yourself. But if you don't have that perspective, mm -mm. you're just going to look and say, well, you know, I have a baby. Uh, my belly's going to sag. My boobs are going to sag. I'm going to be up all night. And, you know, of course, the media is very happy to give you all of these negative crying babies, stress parents. They never show the beautiful side of parenting that hasn't happened since like my three sons that they always just show you screaming babies and exhausted parents and all the negative, negative, negatives and the stress and the money. And so the media will be happy to talk you out of it. You've got to have some standard that says, God, life is worth creating. We have this, you know, I can't, I can't create a rocket ship on my own. I can't build a building on my own, but I can at least do 50% mm -hmm. towards creating an actual human brain. I and mean, that's pretty cool. That's an amazing thing to be able to do. And, but you've got to have some kind of standard that's going to yeah. give that to you as, as even a choice that, that means something, as opposed to just following the hedonism of the everyday, which just leads to a very gray and ashen second half of your life. I'm so depressed now. <laughs> because, no, no, because I think we made the right choice, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not depressed for myself, but... Actually, it's a, it's a, that was a really good promo for my book that's coming out. So the book, by the way, is How to Get Hitched and Stay Hitched. And the <laughs> subtitle is A 12-Step Program for Marriage-Minded Women. So it's literally geared for young women who are caught in the crosshairs of this crap that they're being fed. And they, they're getting sucked into it, even though it's not at all what they want. And they need a roadmap that is completely different that will lead to success in the personal sphere sphere. So that's, so when you say it that way, it's like, Oh, that gets me excited actually, because I have something for oh, them. You got to have a scare story to sell stuff too. Yeah, you know, exactly. That's why global warming. I don't know works, if I should right? use that. Maybe I should. No, use it is. That. And but, yeah, this is another thing too. I've had a number of women on my show who, um, you know, I became a lawyer, you know, I became a lawyer and, or an engineer and I was out in the workforce and, you know, I just found that I just didn't really enjoy it. It was way too harsh, competitive, tough, annoying. Hours were too long. I didn't like all the travel. And then, you know, my sister had a baby and I was like, oh man, I love when I have a baby. So, you know, my husband and I, we talked it over. I decided to have a baby. And after I had the baby, I thought, maybe I'll just have another one. It was so great staying home, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I think that's wonderful. I'm, I'm perfectly thrilled that you have kids. But you realize you stole one engineer and one lawyer from society, right? Because... Oh, you that's a whole other. Oh, yeah. So that's and it's like that's a little selfish, you know. If you don't mind me, I, I've known a whole bunch of women who trained in engineering. Do you know how many of them still work in engineering? Stephane, zero. We, oh my absolute God, we, zero. We could do a whole thing just on that and what it has meant for the family unit and for men and for what most women ultimately find they want in pursuing the the Lord, the, you know, those those careers that they end up not wanting. And then they don't even have the man to depend on because you took it away from them. Like that's a whole other thing. Well, and it's not like you end up with more money as a family because you flood all these women into the workforce. All you do is drive down wages. Yes. So now right. it takes two but, people to support. Yeah. You know, I, I've yes, been watching exactly. it's, as part of my parenting book. I've been watching a few old episodes of my three sons. And because 
my theory is that peaceful parenting has been around forever. And, you know, he is very much a peaceful parent, right? Yeah, I don't it's, it's an old episode. 50s uh, sitcom. And the guy is very reasonable and peaceful, never yells, yeah. never hits, anything like that. But what's fascinating is he's a, he's a worker, right? He's just a guy who works uh, pretty high level in an office. And he's got, you know, three sons and his father-in-law lives with him. They've got two cars, a lovely house in the suburbs on one One salary, and he's got four dependents. And, you know, you you can't, you know, oh, great, we'll just get women out into the workforce so they can make more money. It's like, but they won't because they just drive down the men's way. I know. So then when they complain that they can't survive and they can't stay home because they need two incomes, it's not that they're wrong per se. It's that it didn't have to be this way. Here's why it happened. And there's no connection made between your search for supposed a supposed identity, which is not what ends up happening at all in the workplace and what it ultimately did to you down the road when you cannot stay home with your kid. That's well, Oh, the people who say, I just can't afford to raise my kids. It's like, have you ever heard of a little thing called the middle ages? Yeah, You know, they had approximately 0.0000001% of our wealth. And yet they managed to struggle through and have kids, which is why you exist. If they had your standards, you wouldn't even be here. I know. I know. I know. It's maddening. You know what I watch every day now? But actually, my husband and I both watch. You said you watch My Three Sons because I have to zone out because of what's happening in the world. For one hour every day, I watch The Waltons. Have you seen? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's old school stuff, right? Yeah, that's old school stuff. Old school stuff. But see, the beauty of it, and people, I mean, people listening to this won't laugh because they're smart and whatever, but other people would laugh, but they don't realize that the themes are universal and timeless. Mm -hmm. That's what makes, it's not, it's not the scene of, yeah, the kids are all barefoot and they don't have enough money. and, And I don't glorify that and think that's something to aspire to. I'm just, the messages in it are absolutely timeless and more needed now more than ever. Ah, but this is the interesting question for, I think, everyone in the modern world to ask yourself is that how much money would you give up in order to have meaning? How much money would you, because you say, oh, the Waltons barefoot and so on, but they knew their place in the universe. They had a culture that was sustainable. They knew right from wrong. They knew good and evil. They knew their moral mission in the world. Yep. They They were grounded. They had each other. They had community. They had had family. They had uh, everything in in the world around them. I mean, I'm looking at my three sons. This is a sitcom set in the 1950s, made in the 1950s. Everybody on the street know each other. They all help each other out. They all have a sense of community. And you'd say, well, but they didn't have as much money as we do. It's like, okay, but how much money would you give up in order to have meaning and community? Because right now we've got people who've got lots of money who've been spending 14 months locked in a tiny condo under house arrest because they've got something on Doug Ford, I believe. I don't know, whatever, you know, you got half of the world has opened up and, you know, Ontario is still locked down uh, tighter than a nun's legs. So it's completely, how much money would you give up to have meaning, to have a sense of community, to have a sense of spirituality, to have a sense of why you're here and what the purpose of your life is? Because that's the whole point of the, the devil will give you all of these material things, but will take away your meaning. And after a while, the material things mean nothing and the absence of meaning just rots you from the inside out. We're going to end it there because that's such a perfect ending. <laughs> I love it. Now that we really elevated great. everyone. <laughs> we did. That was great. They're going to be thinking now for a while. I love it. This was really great, Stefan. I really appreciate it. A real pleasure. Out. Let's uh, not leave it so long next time. And uh, let me know when your book comes out. I, I'd yeah. love to read it. Obviously, maybe we have you back on my show to talk more about it. We can oh, even awesome. do a call in if you like. I'm going to be all ready to, to talk about it. Beautiful. I have a great spring. Great to chat with you and uh, take care. Awesome. Thanks, Stefan. Bye. Bye-bye. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker Show. Don't forget to continue the conversation on Facebook by typing in the Facebook search bar, The Suzanne Venker Show. Also, please recommend this podcast to one friend you think would enjoy it. And don't forget to leave us a review on whatever platform you're now using. Finally, if you have a question or comment for me, you can email me at Suzanne at the Suzanne Venker Show.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.